Okay, so uh, we're going to get started today, um, and this is the nature of this course. We, we did a bunch of Photoshop, now it's time to move into InDesign. And we have to do that, so we do Photoshop, then we move into InDesign, then we'll move into Illustrator, then we'll move into AutoCAD. But eventually we'll get back to Photoshop, so it all cycles on itself. And just because today, officially, we're moving from Photoshop to InDesign doesn't mean that you can just arbitrarily say, oh, I'm never going to touch Photoshop again. Okay. The assumption is that every image that you use in InDesign, you will have brought into Photoshop first and made sure it was good. You made sure you tweaked it, made sure you adjusted the levels and all that sort of thing. So it's really important not to forget to use Photoshop. Right? These programs work the best if you use them for their intended purposes, each one, uh, and you'll get better results. So today I'm going to lecture on kind of a, a, an overview of graphic design and what is it and, and kind of just give some base, base information about design. And we'll get into more technical details about it as we go forward. We'll get into more uh, nitty gritty stuff. But today's more overview than anything else. So first off, I want to start with what is the function of design? And throughout the course of today's lecture, I'm referring specifically to graphic design. And that's what I'm going to talk about. But the parallels between graphic design and or industrial design or architectural design or landscape design is all very similar. So a lot of the stuff I'll think about, it's just an adaptation. So let's say I'm talking about graphic design. We're, we're laying something out for a poster, paper, something like that. It's very similar to laying out for a building or very similar to laying out for a product design. And so the, the, the general themes really are true through all design fields. And so just because I'm specifically talking about graphic design doesn't mean it doesn't apply to the other fields as well. Essentially, in the world of graphic design, the function of the design is to communicate messages through the juxtaposition of words and pictures. So we lay those words and pictures out on a page in a way that conveys information to somebody. In a way, it's the visual synthesis of thought. You have a thought about something. You have a thought about some idea, and you want to communicate that idea to somebody else. How do you do it? How do you facilitate that communication? And that's fundamentally what graphic design is about. So if I put this up here and I said, what are some design objectives? You could probably come up with everything that was on this list. Okay? These are things like to guide somebody, so guidance. Maybe it's to persuade somebody to do something. You create a lecture series poster because you want people to go to the lecture in the first place. You create a birthday invitation because you want somebody to come to the birthday. There's always a function behind this. Maybe it's to encourage something or some desired result. Maybe it's political action and you want to encourage people to do something. So you lay it out in a way that, that inspires them to do it. Um, communication, just communicating ideas, even something as simple as that. Motivation, education, dialogue. You see the general theme here. Essentially, we're trying to, to communicate with somebody else. Long term, obviously, we're going to create a portfolio in the class. So I throw in portfolio book style layouts occasionally, just so that you get some background um, and kind of have these visuals sticking in your head long term. So first off, we need to establish some function for our design. So primarily, what is the purpose of this design in the first place? Why are we doing it? Okay, Maybe it's an invitation. Maybe it's a book. Maybe it's a poster. I don't know. Could be a lot of different things. Maybe it's a web page. So what's the purpose? What are we creating? What's the primary objective behind this? What do we want people to do? Come to the birthday party? OK, that's an easy objective. So we're designing the card to get them to come to the birthday party, or the evite, I guess, in this world. But you get the idea. What is your intended audience? So who are you, who are you speaking to? If it's the lecture series poster, you're speaking to students trying to get them to come to the lecture in the first place. So if you have an understanding of who the audience is, that can help in the design process. And what is your desired reaction? So again, in the case of the lecture series poster, you get them to come to the lecture. That's the desired reaction. So if you identify what this stuff is, it's much easier to create the design in the first place. So you always want to think about this. Same thing happens uh, if we were doing an architectural design, for example. We'd go through these same kinds of, of questions. What's the purpose? We're designing a house for somebody. Okay, what's the primary objective? Three bedrooms, two bathrooms, a kitchen, etc. Who's the audience? 
well, who hired you to design the house in the first place? Maybe, you know, in, in the case of somebody hiring you specifically, they have three kids and they have, you know, two dogs and whatever, you get to know that. Maybe you're designing for a hypothetical because you don't necessarily know who the end client's gonna be. In that case, you have to be a little bit more creative. And what's the desired reaction? You want somebody to like the house. You want somebody to live there and enjoy living there. So this setup works for any of those design fields that are out there. Landscape design, industrial design, architectural design, and certainly graphic design. It is the designer's responsibility to create strong communicative messages or experiences that support the function of the design on behalf of the client and for the viewer. And I think there's a couple critical things in this little sentence here that, that if, we, if we analyze it, it gives us some in insight in, into what's going on. So we're creating these experiences that support the function of the design, okay, that should be fairly obvious, on behalf of the client. So the client here is the person who's asking you to do it, or the person who's paying you to do it. It's also important to notice that it's on behalf of the client and for the viewer. So the person who's viewing it isn't necessarily the client. In some cases it is, they're the same person, but some cases it's not. So somebody's paying you to do a birthday invitation, they're the client, but it's really for the people who are going to be invited to the birthday party in the first place. So you have to keep those two things separate as you do your design, because they are separate. Now in some cases, obviously, they overlap and the person's the same. Designer skills, same kind of list here. If I asked you to start to come up with these ideas, you could come up with it, okay? Analysis, perception, communication, research, these are all fairly obvious. Problem solving is a big one, critical thinking, representation, you get the idea. So I'll take a minute and talk about inspiration. And so you probably heard about inspiration before. Somebody said, oh, I'm really inspired by something. I'm inspired by Frank Gehry's work. I don't know. I'm inspired by something specific. In order to be inspired, you have to be aware of your surroundings. And so especially as the semester goes on, and you guys are doing work in this class, and you're in um, 121, and you don't sleep anymore, and you just survive on coffee and whatever, and it's like, oh man, I have that Archie 135 class at 8 a.m. Okay, I'll get there somehow. Okay, I made it. I'm kind of, yeah, he's talking, I think. Okay, so that, that happens. I know, believe it or not, I was in grad school once and it was far worse than you have it right now, okay? You can get really tired. And when you get really tired and you slog your way here, you start to lose awareness of your surroundings. You're not paying attention to what's happening and you're gonna miss things that will inspire you. And so it's important, even though you're slogging your way to class, that you're aware of those surroundings. More often than not, inspiration comes from the stuff that's around you. And if you're close to it because you're too tired and you're not, you're not perceptive of it, you're gonna miss those moments of inspiration. You know, maybe it's you're walking here today and you see the thunder and lightning in the clouds. And maybe that inspires you in some weird way. You know, it's those kinds of things that happen to you in everyday life. I mean, today it was cloudy, so it wasn't a particularly good day. But I walk every morning, I walk from here and I go up to the copy center to get the copies to hand out to you, right? And there was a morning three weeks ago where I was walking up there and it happened to be the exact right time so that the sun was just rising and it was casting these long orange light streaks across the concrete. And it was really cool. And it had to do with the elevation of the sun and where I was and what I was walking through. That was an inspiring moment. Just because I was walking and I had my eyes open and I was awake. So you wanna do the same thing. You wanna stay awake. You wanna be observant, right? And I know as, all, as you're all like, oh please, don't, don't pick on me, right? It's found and transformed into tangible objects. So you get inspired by something, you take that something and you make something even better out of it. That's the whole point. It's different for everyone, okay? So maybe, maybe um, Stuart and I go see a lecture, okay? It's, it's uh, somebody's coming to speak, it's an architectural lecture, and we sit down there and we're watching it. Maybe it's Rick Joy, okay? I'm picking on somebody specific, okay? So we're sitting there and we're watching Rick Joy, and Stuart, you're sitting there and you're watching it, and you get really inspired by the Core 10 steel that he's using. You say, oh, that's really cool in the desert and the colors, and I'm really into that, okay? 
I could be watching the exact same lecture and be paying no attention to the Corten steel or the colors and be paying entirely with how he, how he composes two buildings next to each other to create a bottleneck that you then suddenly get through and see a view. It's two different, completely different experiences, even though we're in the same room watching the same person talk. That's important to recognize. So your inspiration is different than somebody else's. And you can't expect it to be the same. So if you have a buddy and you go see something together, you're going to have different end results. And that's to be expected. Intuition shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be a chore. You shouldn't have to work at it. You guys are all here because you're interested in design in the first place. You like design. You like the way things are presented to you. Right? It's kind of like, OK, you, you get a new iPhone, right? and you open up the box. And it's a really cool box. Like The way they pack it is really cool, or whatever. That should be inspiring to you just because of the way they packed it, because it's an appreciation of design. Maybe it's looking at the fonts on something. You say, wow, they did a really neat job on this. Those kinds of things should just happen naturally. You should be inspired by that. It comes from a desire to create or communicate. You're all here because you have that desire. And I'm, you know, it's, it's lucky I'm speaking to all of you and you already have this desire. So I'm not trying to inspire you into this desire. You already have this. Also, don't forget to look inward. Because sometimes you do something and that helps inspire you. And maybe it's pottery. Maybe it's uh, drawing. Maybe it's sketching. Maybe it's painting. I don't know. Maybe it's something that gets you excited. Right? For me, it's probably building things. I like to go out and I like to build things. So if that inspires you, do it more often. It'll help. You need to collect these things that inspire you. Okay, so we're all really lucky because we now carry phones that have good cameras in them. So if you see something you like, or that moment when the light streaks are coming across the concrete, you take a picture of it. Then you can remember it. Right? In the old days, all we had was a sketchbook. We didn't have a phone to snap the picture. So you had to sit down and you had to try to draw it out. How many people actually use a sketchbook in here right now? It's always shocking to me how few people recognize that. Okay? I recognize, OK, I'm starting to be out of school for a while. And I don't carry my sketchbook with me everywhere that I go. But I know, I know. Right? I know. It's because I don't have time anymore. Right? But you're all in school, and there's no reason you shouldn't have that sketchbook. It's important for you to have a sketchbook that you like to use. Find the one that fits you. Is it too big? Is it too small? I liked a really small one. It was a moleskin. I have one of my, of my old ones in the office. It was a moleskin that was a Japanese fold. And so it was a continuous sheet of paper, so you could just keep stretching it out and keep drawing. It was really cool. And it was small enough so that I could fit it in my back pocket. It was about the size of my phone. And that was perfect for me in school because I could carry it with me. If you don't have it, it's hard to draw it. But you can also, of course, use your phone to capture pictures. That's a good way of doing it. Make notes, drawings, photographs, all that stuff helps you remember those things. The other thing that happens is you might be looking at something and you say, oh, I really like that idea. It's not relevant to anything I'm doing right now. And in two years, you're in some studio. You say, oh, yeah, I remember that thing that I saw two years ago. And it fits now. And I can build upon that. So that's part of collecting it, is, is keeping it stored in the back of your mind. How do you nurture your inspiration? So obviously, if you carry your sketchbook with you, that's a good thing. If you carry your phone with you to take pictures, that's a good thing. You also want to be immersed in the design field in general. So we're here. We like designing. Part of what fulfills my life, being out of school, is coming here two days a week and seeing all of you and seeing what you guys come up with. Talking to the people in 220 that are doing design projects, thinking about their designs. Right? I know it sounds scary, but I go to bed at night and sometimes I'm thinking about some design somebody else is doing, not even in my class, trying to tweak it and work on it. Because I like design, it's a fundamental desire. Same thing happens for all of you. You're around each other right now. Look at what other people are, are doing. Think about those things that other people are doing. It can make a big difference. So you become immersed in design. And being in school is great because there's a bunch of you doing it all together anyway. So that helps. Commit to discovering and, and collecting new inspirational factors. That means essentially going and looking at stuff that other people are doing, walking around, being observant. Look at the other architectural things that are going on if you're, if you're in architecture. Those things are important. 
Communicate with other designers. The more you try to talk about design, the better you are at communicating your ideas back and forth. So sit down and talk to your neighbor about it. A lot of times in 220, people end up in partners, which is great because you have to work out design details and you have to figure out how to communicate one idea to somebody else. You're in 121 right now, you don't have a partner. But you probably have a friend that's in the class. It's my guess. So if you have a friend that's in the class, talk to them about your design. You're not wasting their time because you'll reciprocate and you'll listen to them talk about their design. And it'll make both of you better. Right? Sometimes you just feel a little stuck. If you feel stuck, go do something else. Go take a walk, go take a run. If you work out, go work out. Whatever it is, go do that. Sometimes listening to music is a great way to be inspired. So music is a really funny one because sometimes it works and you have to figure out what works for you. Okay, so I was in grad school. I had to write my master's thesis. The way that grad school works is you do this big project and this lead up for a year to your thesis. You do this big presentation and then it's over and you have to write like a 100 page paper about it. And if you want to actually graduate on time, you have three weeks to write the 100 page paper, which is not, not a lot of time. Okay, obviously research and all that kind of stuff. And so you're trying to do this. So I, I got done. It was time to write this paper, and I sat down, I would come in, I'm a, I'm, I've always been a morning person, so I would come in at like 3 or 4 in the morning, and I'd work all morning and end at like 10 or 11 at, in the morning, and then I'd go off and do something else. So I'd work that early shift, because that's, that's the type of person I am. Some people are, are late night people, you do the opposite, it is what it is. It was great for me because nobody else was around, because everybody else was a late night person, and nobody bothered me. So I would come in, and I'd sit down at my laptop, and I'd start to write. And in order to be inspired, I wanted some music playing in the background. And so I had to try out different stuff. So here's the funny part. I wrote my entire master's thesis to the soundtrack of Pirates of the Caribbean. The first one, because it was a long time ago. First one, on repeat. I don't think I've listened to the soundtrack of Pirates of the Caribbean since, <laughs> right? So it's pretty funny how something can just work for you. Okay, if I'm out working right now, I'm not gonna turn on the Pirates of the Caribbean to work. But it worked when I was writing, and it inspired me and kept me going in writing. So if listening to music works, try some different stuff, because it might work for you if you're stuck. Okay, explore other areas of interest. If you like to do other things, go do those other things. That will help and feedback. The other thing is to attend conferences or lectures. So in the spring, we always put on a lecture series here at DVC. Uh, in the architecture program, there's a bunch of visiting architects that come in and talk. Listening to somebody else talk about their work a lot of times can be very inspiring. If you, if you want, go into the Berkeley lecture series. If you're, if you're interested in architecture, you can go in there. I forget what night. I think it used to be on Wednesday nights. It might be on Thursday nights. I don't know. You can look it up. And they have, obviously, they have a little bit more pull than, than we do here at DVC. And they have some big name people come in. I remember when I was in grad school, I saw Tom Main speak about his designs. It can be really inspiring to listen to some big name person come and talk about their designs. So go seek those kinds of events out. They can be really helpful for your design process. Explore, try something new. Man, apparently I talked too long on that slide. Sorry. Come on, wake back up. Where's Keynote? There we go. Did I skip anything? No. OK. Inspiration is always the first step toward the final design. You need that spark to go forward. I just find that cover amusing. So let's talk a little bit about the design process. And I'll talk about each of these in more depth. Essentially, we go through this process, research, information gathering, brainstorming, conceptualization, experimentation, development, and finally execution. Not like execution, but like execution, I'm doing it. Sometimes it might feel like execution. The design process. Number one, absolutely, fundamentally, you cannot skip a step. It won't work. It won't work. You skip a step and you jump to a conclusion, you'll have something that's unresolved and you'll have to go back and do that step anyway. Not necessarily, not necessarily. Sometimes you bounce around, and sometimes you jump forward 
and then you realize you have to go back. That's normal as part of the design process. So it's not a linear. It's more like a bunch of circles that overlap. It's probably the better way of looking at it. But you can't just ignore one piece of it. So if, for example, I ignored where, uh, and I'll speak specifically to architecture in this context, I'm designing a house and I ex ignored the research stage, that would be a problematic. Right? I'd ha eventually have to come back to that research stage and understand. You know, I could be working on form and have this great idea, but if it didn't fit within the context of what I was trying to do, because I hadn't done the research to really understand the, the person or the family that I was designing for or whatever, I'd have to go back and deal with that anyway. So you can never skip the steps. You also can't focus on the final product. And I think this is sometimes what students in the design fields get stuck with is that they have a preconceived idea about this is what I'm trying to make at the end. And I'm going to make all these steps line up to get me to that point. Well, the problem is if you jump to that point and you're, you're trying to force everything to that one specific idea that's out there, you're going to miss all these other forks and opportunities that are going to be better than that one thing that you think is out there. So you might get to the end, and you might be able to justify the end, but it won't be as good as one of the side forks that got to a better end. And that's really important. Design is always an evolution. Anybody get done with a studio project? Let's say you're in 121, you do something, and you're like, oh, it's finished. And then you look at it again the next day, and you're like, well, I could probably change that, and work on it a little bit more. Okay. So I spent, um, this is again in grad school, it was not part of thesis, it was a different studio. It was called the Comprehensive Studio. Um, and we had to design a sailboat, America's Cup sailboat racing facility. It's a really cool project. Okay? And in my particular design scheme, there was a cube with a sphere inside. That was a, a kind of a fundamental part of this design process for me. And I worked the whole semester on this freaking cube. It was just a cube. And I worked it, and I worked it, and I worked it, and I worked it. And I finished, and we got through the final and whatever. And I sat down with the professor who was in charge. And uh, we were talking. And she said, so do you feel like you, you conquered the cube? I said, yeah, I'm ready to move on. Maybe a rectangle next time. Right? Because I had worked it, and worked it, and worked it, and evolved it, and evolved it, even though it was as simple as a cube. So in this process, you have to work and evolve. That's how the end result becomes better. If you have the one target out there and you just go linear to that, there is no evolution. It's not getting better. So we need that evolution. Every step needs to have your full attention. So if you're distracted, you're not putting in your effort. That's the cool thing about design. So we don't have to write, well, sometimes we do. But for the most part, we don't have to write the giant thesis history papers. We don't have to read a bunch of books. Right? We get to design. That's what we spend our time doing. Right? I remember talking to people as an, uh, as an undergrad. You know, they're in, like, uh, my best friend was a history major. He's like, why do you do architecture? Like, you're, you're, you never sleep. You're up all night. Like, it's awful. I said, well, while you're reading books and writing papers, I get to build models. I mean, how much more fun is that? I get to draw, right? So it's different, but you have to put as much effort in or more than somebody who's doing something else. The difference is, hopefully, you love doing it. That's the point, OK? It can be completely exhausting, but I promise you, when something happens and it works and it clicks and you get something awesome out of the other end, it's the most rewarding feeling ever. And that's part of what's so great about the design field in general, is you're actually creating something. OK, so the project brief. This is the initiation of the design process. This is we're getting started. It should be a very meticulous overview of the project. A lot of times it's not. And there's a bunch of holes in it. And you need to figure out what those details are and what those challenges are. So you, you need to question. You need to, to figure these things out. It should define the role of the designer, the client, right, and ultimately the viewer or the person who's, who's this is intended for. Okay? So we need to define that because it helps if you define it. We begin with the information that's given by the client. So we're going to design a lecture series poster. And I keep emphasizing the lecture series poster because that's what you're going to design as your next assignment. In 103. So I give you a handout. It has information about the lecture series on it. Hopefully it's fairly complete, but maybe there's some, there's some holes. If so, you need to ask me, clarify, and simplify that information that I gave you. Get that clarity and feel like you know where you're going. 
you as the designer are responsible for asking questions to clarify this. Who's, who's coming to speak in the lecture series? You ask that question. Who, uh, you know, who's this intended to be for? Well, it's probably intended for students. Right? Those, are, those are you, as the designer, seeking clarification and asking questions about what's, what's this really for. Right? You define the primary goals and the messages to be expressed. So obviously, the goal in a lecture series poster, get somebody to come to the lecture. Messages to be expressed, these are the lectures, these are the times of the lecture. Define restrictions, budget. It's kind of the big one that's out there. Good news for your lecture series poster, you don't have a budget, so we're good. Okay. Define a timetable for completion. Well, in this case, I defined the timetable for you. It's going to have a due date. You're going to have to have it done by then. But if you're working for somebody else, you guys need to have a mutual understanding about when this product is due. That's important. And then obviously define the audience. Who's this for? Then we move into the gathering phase. This is where you're going to collect all of the stuff that will ultimately be assembled into your design. So you're trying to go out and get that. It could be information, but it could also be writing. It could be logos. Maybe it's the DVC logo, whatever. You're trying to collect that information. If there's anything that's missing, you need to request it. So I've done some website design for people. I did one a while back where it was somebody who was running for a campaign. Uh, they were going to be a, a superintendent or something of schools. And so I, I said, sure, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll set up your website for you and whatever. And this person said, I, you know, I, I, I want to have information about my family on there, and I want to have information about um, you know, my intended goals and being superintendent and whatever. And I said, sure, no problem. I'll set out the, form, you know, the, the, the formatting and get the website ready for you and do the logos and that sort of thing. But you need to come up with this stuff. So that's important, because I needed to define you, the candidate, should write this information. And then me, the designer, I'll format it and put it on the page. It shouldn't be my responsibility to write that information. So you need to make sure that you clarify this and get that information. Then we move into research. One of the cool things about design is that whenever you're doing a design, it's your responsibility to understand what's involved in that design. And it might be interesting to you. It might not be interesting to you. So you guys last semester, the industrial design guys, you did those speakers. Okay. Well, if you're going to design a speaker, for example, you have to understand what is a speaker, what are the components of a speaker, what, are, what other speakers are out there, what are people doing in speakers, how is my speaker going to be innovative. You have to do all that research to really understand the topic or the thing that I'm trying to design. Right? Maybe, maybe you in the architectural design realm you're asked to design a museum. Well, you have, to, you have to learn about a museum, what's involved in a museum. Maybe you're asked to design a theater. Well, if you've never been in the back bowels of a theater, you have no idea what goes on back there. You have no idea how the stuff works and how they move the scenes around. So in order for you to do that design work, you have to go learn a bunch about that field so that you can then incorporate it back into design. And that's part of why firms tend to specialize on specific things. So you might be in a firm, and they, they are really good at doing theaters. They're going to do lots of them, because they have a bunch of the background research. And it's going to be rare for that firm to flip over and do housing, because they don't necessarily have the skill set that's ready in the research to do the housing. You in school, we're going to constantly throw things at you. So you're doing, uh, in 121, you're doing two museums this, this semester, if you're in 121. You're doing museums. Then you're going to move on to 220, and suddenly you're doing a school. Maybe you're going to do housing. So you're going to scatter, and you're going to jump between different things, and you're going to find out what you're interested in. But at the same time, you have to really do that research to understand. Read, evaluate, and understand all the provided materials. If you don't read it, if you don't understand it, it's kind of like, let's say you were designing the cover of a book. You should probably read the book first, right? Same kind of thing. You need that background information. Independently research additional information. So don't always just say, client, hand me all of your information, 
and I'll go from there. Go do, do, go do research. Google's your best friend. Go find other stuff. View the client's current communication materials. So in this case, it's more graphic design based. But in, in, in this example, do they already have form letters that they send out? Do they already have a logo? Do they already have a bunch of background information? Do they already have a color scheme? DVC has a color scheme. Are we using the same colors or not? Right? For the lecture series poster, don't use the same colors. <laughs> do, do something that's inspiring instead. Investigate competitive markets. Who else is doing the same thing that you're doing? Then we move into brainstorming. This is when you're just getting your ideas out. You're sketching things. You're just throwing out things and seeing what kind of sticks. Maybe you're doing mind maps and, and free writing and, and stuff like that to try to cultivate this process. Then we get into conceptualization. This is really when the design starts to happen. You're formulating a plan for the project, and this plan is the thematic link between the design, the function, and ultimately the delivery of, of what it is that you're, you're trying to deliver. Then we get into this experimentation, multiple studies of color, different images, different treatments of images. You're trying to make this happen. So this is the actual design process here, where we're, where we're really getting into creating the end result. And you're trying a bunch of things. You're going to develop the different treatments. You're going to vary the, the um, sequences. You're going to try something different, try something out of left field and fold that one in and see what happens. Introduce graphic shapes, lines, etc. We get into execution. You're distilling down the best ideas from your experimentation phase, getting it into that one that this is it. This is the right one. You are examining every detail. Big scale stuff, does it look good from far away? Small scale stuff, what's the difference? Is the, are my font types consistent? What about my tracking and my kerning of my, of my typography? Is all of those little scale details, are they working? Divorce from attachment. So this right here is probably the most important thing that you, as a designer, can learn. Divorce from attachment is absolutely critical. So you do a bunch of work, and I'll use the architectural example, because I think most of you are in the architectural realm. You spend hours and hours working on a little model. right? It's like, oh, I got this thing. I'm, I'm really into it. You come into studio, and your professor picks it up, says, you know, it would look a lot better if we remove this part, and maybe we stuck it over there, and maybe we'll take some scissors and we'll cut it here, and, right? And your initial reaction is, ha, don't do that. That means you're attached, OK? And it's really hard. You spend hours, and you're obsessed about this one particular project. You become attached to it. But if you're attached to it, you can't listen to what somebody is saying when they're giving you feedback and critique. So you have to learn to step back from your work. right? It's due. You're in the final presentation phase. As soon as you've presented and you're starting to get feedback, don't treat it as a, as a personal object anymore. Try to step back and look at it as one of the other critiquers that are in there looking at it with you. Because they're coming to try to teach you something. Okay, You're in 121. You're in 220. You get to the final review. Daniel or um, Anthony invites a bunch of people to come in and talk to you about your design process. All of those people are coming here voluntarily. They're not getting paid. They're not doing other work that's paying them to do it. And they're coming in here to talk to you as a student. And when they're doing that, they're doing it to make you better. Not to hurt you or to hurt your feelings or to tear up your model. They're trying to teach you about design. They're trying to use their experiences and part their wisdom onto you. So if you become attached, you won't listen. If you become detached and you look at it objectively, you will learn far more. So this is really, really important. And it's also really hard. Okay? Analyze objectively. This means step back and look at your work. Is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? Go back and reread the project. Did I solve the problems that I was asked to solve? And then you produce that final draft to give to the client. Intuition. Trusting your inner voice. So no matter how much you learn the fundamentals of design, you have to trust that intuitive vision. Is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? Does it look the way it's supposed to look? 
And it's really hard as a young designer to trust that. If good comprehension of techniques was all that it took, computers could do design. We wouldn't need us as humans to do design because they can learn the techniques. That's you know scripted. It's easy. Intuition is that other thing that computers can't do. And that's what makes the best designers out there. It's a different level of thinking. It complements your rational thought. It's the irrational, weird ideas that are floating around in the back of your head. Those things are really valuable. It should come naturally. You can't force it, because as soon as you force it, it becomes rational. Therefore, it's part of the other side. It allows for thoughts that would not come through a rational thought process. So it's that spark of an idea that's kind of out there. Your intuitive functions are for your own guidance. Are you going in the right direction? It can be for your own protection. Ooh, that's a bad idea. Maybe I shouldn't do that. It could be for inspiration. Could be for enlightenment or synthesis as well. Intuition cultivates your imagination. It allows designers to move beyond your comfort zone. And I think it's important to recognize, certainly in this class, and you have to, you have to see what a, what a particular studio is like. But in this class, I will never penalize you for going out on a limb and trying something. If it fails miserably, I have regrades available for you. So try something. Push yourself further than you think is possible, because your end results are going to be far better than if you stick within that context of, I'm just going to be safe. It leads to the fresh and the innovative solutions. The best designers out there are the ones that take big leaps and try something new. That leap is critical. It increases the number of ideas that you might have, the number of branches or forks that you can explore. And it can often provide that spark to push you forward when you're stuck. You have to allow the intuition to surface without worrying about the final product. So in intuition, ah, that feels like I should do this, but I don't know if it's going to work. But let me try it and see. You've got to go for it and see. And then you can go back and edit and say, your rational side says, no, that didn't work. But you've got to let it try. It takes time to believe your instincts are valuable. And you may have experienced this um, in a review. You've designed something. And the reviewer comes in and is about to talk to you about your design. And they go, yeah, it just doesn't feel right. Anybody experienced that before? Right? Yeah, there's just something a little bit off about it. That's the, that's the critiquer, his or her, inspira or her intuition, saying, no, nah, it's not quite right. And so it's important to really understand that that's just a gut feeling about it. And you should have that same gut feeling. Sometimes it's, that's right on. It just works. And I can feel it. That's what we want. You also can't prejudge or abandon ideas. You can't just throw them out. That's stupid. Don't do that. Let it mature, because it might fold into your final design. And it's not always useful or appropriate. So sometimes it doesn't work. You want to nurture that intuition. Don't be afraid to take risks. Listen to that inner voice and act on it. Expect the unexpected. Don't overanalyze, and record your thoughts and collect your ideas. In the design process, there are things that you think about rationally, those that you learn about, and those that you're looking for. And then there's the most interesting part that you cannot be rational about. You just feel it for some strange reason. If you feel right, it'll fit perfectly within your context or your concept and make it more interesting and unique. So that's this, the second half is about intuition. It just feels right. And if you feel it, it's going to make it better. OK, so today, as part of your exercise 109, okay, we're going to move into InDesign. I'm going to give you a, a walkthrough of InDesign. And I know I'm talking longer than normal today by the time I'm done with all of this stuff. But you'll go through the InDesign section fairly quickly today. Um, we're going to be designing an album cover. It's kind of getting your feet wet in the world of InDesign. And I think, I think it's fun. And I think it's fun to see what people pick. Um, and I used to not actually, uh, this is the first time I've ever shown album covers. But 
they're kind of goofy and they're kind of fun. So why not show a few in slide format and then uh, we'll move into creating your own. What you're going to be doing is pick your favorite band or artist and design a new album. They're coming out with a new album. What's that cover going to look like? So I got a lot of these images from uh, either the Rolling Stone Top 100 Albums of All Time um, or the uh, Billboard Top 100 Album Covers. Uh, so there's, there, other people have rated these along the way. And, some, and I've tried to cover as much spectrum of music as possible so that hopefully everybody in this room will see something they recognize. Okay? Music is, of course, a very personal thing. And you're always weighted towards your own music likes. But I've tried to include a lot. And sometimes right, the cover is independent of who the musician is. And I will admit there's a few in here that I have no idea who they are. But sometimes the covers speak a lot. So we don't, we don't need to spend a long time on a lot of these. But if you think a lot about how these things are set up, right, one of the things about an album cover is it's a square. So you're designing within the context of a square. But the off-center rules still apply. right? Michael Jackson's still off-center by a third. So the rule of thirds still applies. Right? Sometimes it's about the context or what's actually happening in the album that gives us our perspective. Right? Sometimes these are uh, goofy, too. Right? This is probably before Photoshop. This is probably somebody drew it in, right? But it's a lot about composition. A lot of the same stuff that we've talked about in class is happening in these images. Uh, this is a great cover. And I had to show the whole thing because of the backside. <gasps> composition, strong diagonal. Sometimes it's really simple. Right? The ones that you're going to create today aren't quite this simple. Okay? Because you, you won't get as far in InDesign. We have to get images and stuff like that. But it can be this simple. This is another great one. right? This, this is aging me a little bit. This was like huge when I was in high school. <laughs> and you guys are like, who is that? Um, but these, these, these are iconic album covers. This actually made, I think it was in the top 25 album covers of all time. It's just kind of entertaining. OK, so this one. Chris Lane, there's two versions of this album. There's a regular album, and then there's an acoustic version of the album. So this is the regular album cover, and that's the acoustic version album cover. So it's essentially the same album cover with a different treatment. And so I like to show that, or I wanted to show that as an example of two versions. So you're in the design process. You're figuring out what's going to work and what's not going to work. Sometimes you do different versions, and you see which one looks better. And in this case, both versions ended up being actual albums. I had to put this one in here. It's kind of like the stuff you guys were just doing in Photoshop, right? I had to put some Lady Gaga's in here, too. I mean, these are, these are pretty iconic, right? But they're, they're really well done. The album cover is very, very well done. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Lady Gaga all the way back to Led Zeppelin. I mean, you know, entertaining. This one, I have no idea who she was, right? But if you think about thematically, car wheels on a gravel road, photograph's pretty appropriate and how that comes together. I should have included like Hotel California or something in that same vein. Okay. I, had to, I had to throw this in for my wife. I mean, you know, clearly we're dating ourselves. But um, yeah, so I put that in for her. OK, so we were talking a while back. I told you I, I did the, um, the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean soundtrack. Whenever I was modeling in the studio and like building models and stuff, this was the album that I listened to. And it's still, I would argue, one of my favorite albums of all time. So I had to include what one of my favorite albums was. This is the Symphony of Metallica. They played with the San Francisco Symphony, one live concert. And it's an incredible album. The whole thing is awesome. 
But you have to like Metallica, I guess. But having the full symphony behind him was really cool. But look at the symmetry here and the setup of how this whole thing works with the off-center logo down in the corner. Really well done album cover. Pretty, pretty classic. This is another good one. All right, more current. Trying to throw in some current ones. Sam Hunt, body like a back road. Texture, very simple, very plain. Really well done. I also had to throw this one in here, right? You guys have seen this album before, probably, at some point. No? No, you're shaking your heads like, God, no, right? This, OK, so side story, side story. Okay. You guys know I like side stories. So I know that I'm old. I get that. Okay, I get that. However, okay, so Garth Wilkes was really big like when I was in middle school or so. And there was a lot of that going on. This album, I forget exactly when it came out. Okay? If you look at it graphically, it's actually pretty good, other than the fact that it's so 80s it's ridiculous, right? Or early 90s. Anyway. So then Garth Brooks went away. And he like, decided to raise his kids or whatever. And uh, like, nobody heard from him forever. And then he decided to come back and tour like a year and a half ago. And my wife is like, oh, we should go see Garth Brooks. And I'm like, all right, all right, we'll go see Garth Brooks. He's supposed to be really good. We'll go see him. No big, you know, OK. So she's like, OK, I'm going to get tickets. I'm going to, OK, well, that's fine. So she gets tickets in Sacramento. And we're looking at the tickets after she bought them. And it's a 10 PM start. I'm like, what? Like, who starts a concert at 10 PM? OK, so anyway, we ended up going. And we had a great time. We, we tailgated before. It was fun. Anyway, side note, OK? So he played a 7 o'clock show. And then he played our show at like 10, which ended up being about 11. He played until 2 in the morning. And I will tell you right now, I've seen a lot of people. He is the best person I have ever seen live. He was absolutely, insanely incredible. So if you have the opportunity to go, even though he's like ancient and fat and Garth, I would really go see him. He was really good. He was really, really good. Anyway, so um, I had to throw that one in there because it's kind of fun. Sorry for the side story. Taylor Swift. It's great. Great album cover. Abbey Road. This is about as classic as it gets, right? I had to throw a Rolling Stones in there. The newest Taylor Swift. You guys saw that this came out, right? Really interesting graphically, if you think about it. Whoever did the graphic design of this thought a lot about what was happening. Right? The articles and the way it all kind of comes together. The composition of it, the symmetry of it, it's really, really well done. OK, so enough of the album covers. Obviously, if I didn't hit on one of your favorite artists of all time, I apologize. Right? I tried to get a broad spectrum in there and make sure that everybody got some credit. So we're going to move over. I'm going to stop this recording, move over, and we're going to start with the introduction to InDesign. OK, so on we continue. Uh, I'm going to start with the kind of nitty gritty introduction to InDesign. Um, InDesign, fundamentally, what, what you need to understand about InDesign, it is about layouts. It's about graphically putting something on the page and the organization of pictures and fonts and type and how it all comes together. And so it's not about editing photos. It's not about making photos look better. That happens in Photoshop. And it's also not about drawing, which is a more illustrator so side of things. So in conjunction, this is the pro program that kind of assembles everything together. And so even, even to the extent that you're doing, say, a working drawing set in AutoCAD or whatever, ultimately you probably create an InDesign file to do the final layouts. And there's a lot of things that are built into InDesign that help with those layouts, uh, page numbers and that sort of thing. Uh, for what we're going to be doing today, we're going to create a single page. I'm going to go ahead and open up InDesign. If you don't see it anywhere, you'll have to go into the All Apps and go to Adobe Design Standard and then choose Adobe InDesign CS6.
probably should have opened it up in advance because it tends to be a little on the slow side. Sometimes it won't open for you, in which case you close it and open it again. I don't know why. It's the school computers. There we go. See, at least it happens to me too, right? Let's try it again. Oh, come on. I knew at least a cup of, couple of you already have it open, right? There we go. So it finally opened. Sometimes it takes a few tries. I don't know why. I don't know why. OK, so when I open up InDesign, I get this first little splash screen set up. And on the little splash screen setup, I'm creating a new document. In this class, we're not ever going to do a book or a library. So you, don't, you can skip those two options. They're always going to be documents. So I'll click on document, and I get the new document little dialog box here that pops up. Under document preset, sometimes there are presets. I have none set on this computer. You probably don't on yours as well. Our intent here, this is important. Um, and for the most part, Everything that we're creating, our ultimate intent is to print it. Therefore, our intent should be set to print. If we were intending to publish it digitally or put it on the web, we could use one of those other options. For what we're doing, we're getting the habit of saying it's for print. That has to do with color space. I'll talk about uh, that in a little bit. Number of pages today is only one. Start of page number is one. We do not need facing pages. Facing pages essentially means I have two pages like a book, and I have content on both sides of the page, and they open up like that. So we don't want that today. We're just doing a single page. So I'll uncheck that. Page size is set right now at letter. We want to come down here and choose compact disc, because it's going to be an album cover. Not that anybody actually gets CDs anymore, but. Anyway, we're going to choose compact disk. Uh, notice that the width and height are listed in really strange values. This width and height is a unit called a pica, which is a graphic design layout unit. If you worked for a magazine, they would be doing their units in picas. For me, it's like looking at a foreign language. I have no idea what it means. So the good news is, if you wanted to specify a specific size, let's say I wanted 11 by 17, I could say width 17 I n, and notice it, it updates for me by uh, 11 I n, and it updates to whatever the, the correct pica dimension is. So I can use inches in those boxes as well. I'm going to show you how to switch the units to inches uh, afterward. So once again, I'll go back to this compact disk. There we go. Because it's a square, the orientation doesn't matter. Columns, defaults are fine. Margins here, those are all fine. Although, you know what, to, to keep you guys from being too confused, let's take our margins to zero. Just type zero in the first box, press tab, and all of them will change because that little lock sign is turned on. So they should all say zero. And then I, when I'm done, I'll go ahead and say OK. And InDesign creates a file for me. The reason that I set the margins at zero is because I just didn't want you guys to be confused by margins right now. We'll get to that a little bit later on. So essentially, as I look at this page in InDesign, the, the page square right here with a slight little drop shadow on the, on the right side and the bottom, that represents the page size that I'm actually working with. So everything can go on that page. At the top, going across, like I do with Photoshop and I'll do with each software program as we go through, I'm going to go through the basic kind of layout, setup, etc. We have our traditional menu structure up at the top. Most of the things that you're going to be working with will be in layout, type, or object. Those are the most common menu items. But again, most of the tools are also available in the toolbars. Below the traditional file menu setup, we have a ribbon that contextually changes, just like Photoshop. You pick a different tool. For example, if I pick the type tool, suddenly I get a different ribbon with all the type-related commands. 
If I go back to the frame tool, I get information about the frame. So that, that contextual ribbon is going to change and update based on what tool is available to me. Down the left side here, I have my standard set of tools. Most of the tools that you'll use frequently in InDesign are all listed right there, easy access. A few of them, like Photoshop, have nested tools. So the, the T for type, uh, if I click and hold, I can get type on a path or just plain type. So sometimes they have extras, not too much in here versus Photoshop where almost all of them have extras underneath. As I go over to the right side of the page here, up at the top is something right now that for me says advanced. You're, you might not say advanced, you might say something else. These are the workspaces. Just like in Photoshop, we switched to the photography one when we were working on photos. In this case, we will switch a little bit later on into the typography, for example. It gives us a different set of tools relating to typography. If we go back to the essentials, this gives us our most basic set of tools. Uh, I tend to leave it on advanced, but it, it doesn't really matter. Okay? I'll go back to essentials because that's probably the simplest for right now. Okay, on the right side here, we have several different um, menus or windows, much like Photoshop. We have our pages, which if we had multiple pages would show up here. For today, we're only doing one page, so it doesn't matter. We have layers, a lot like Photoshop. What's on top is on top. The difference is in InDesign, you can have multiple objects on a single layer, where in Photoshop, you have one object on each layer. So it's a little bit different, uh, and we'll talk about that as we go forward. For what you're doing today, we don't need to worry about layers at all. Okay? The next thing down here is called links. And this is a really important thing for you to understand about InDesign. InDesign does not copy information into the file itself. InDesign is all about layout. And so you choose this image goes here, and you can find this image, InDesign, in this folder on my flash drive. And so it's all that exists is a link between your original image and the layout of where it goes in your final work it doesn't actually embed the image in your final work. So you have to make sure that anything you use gets saved in a location where you can reuse it. Does that make sense? So if, for example, today I download a picture, I need to make sure that picture is saved on my flash drive or in my OneDrive so that I can use it and open this file again later. If you lose that file, you either have to find it again or the ultimate output will be blurry. We'll get a pixelated version of it. It won't be clear. So this happens frequently in the class. So I'm trying to overemphasize it early so that you remember you have to keep track of it. We come down here. There's a few other options. Stroke is a line color, essentially. Color is typically for fill colors. We'll talk about that. And then I have swatches. We're not going to worry about that quite yet. So let's go ahead and start working on the page itself. Before I get started, though, I'm going to right click right where the two rulers meet. And when I right click where the two rulers meet, notice that I can change my units. So it's in picas right now, and I can switch to inches. I prefer working in inches because I can see that, oh, this is four and a half inches, as opposed to picas doesn't mean anything to me. Okay, So now that it's in inches, and obviously if you, if you prefer to use centimeters or millimeters, you could do that too. Um, but I'm going to work in inches because that's what is familiar to me. So now that I have this kind of set up and ready to go, I need to go start collecting the content that's going to make up my album cover. Okay? So I'll go back and we'll go to my Creative Commons search here and, oh, let's see, what am I going to create? Um, who should I pick? Well, we'll do Garth Brooks, why not, right? So um, let's do, I want to do a farm. So I'm going to search Flickr for a farm. All right, I kind of like that image. Let's go ahead and download that image. Now remember, I need to save this image in a location on my flash drive so that I can use it later on. So let me go ahead and show it in the folder once it's done downloading. There it is. I'm going to copy this file, and I'm going to put it in my, oops, sorry, wrong 
thing. Let's go into today's folder. Fall 2017. And I'll go ahead and paste that into the folder. So there it is. Now I need to get that image into my InDesign file. So I'll go back to InDesign. And in order to place it in the, in the scene here, the easiest way of doing that is to draw something called a frame. And if I look over on the left-hand side, there's a rectangle with an X in it. That's called a frame. And so I will pick that frame. And I'll go ahead and draw it from one corner to the other corner. And we'll assume that it's going to be a full frame image. I'm just using the one image. So I have that, and it shows up as an object. In this case, it's blue, and it has an X in it. This represents a container that I can then drop or place my file into. So with it selected, it's selected right now, I'll go up to the File menu, and I'll go to Place. It's also Control D is the sh keyboard shortcut. And I will go to today's folder, and I'll pick that farm image. And I'll go ahead and say Open. OK, so when I do that, though, notice I didn't get the whole image. And if I zoom out a little bit, and I were to double click on the image, we could see that there's a lot more image that I didn't get. So what I can do is I can select the image itself. And I can right click on the image and go to a menu option called Fitting. And inside the Fitting menu, I have several different options. I can fill frame proportionally. I could fit content proportionally. I can fit frame to content. I can fit content to frame. And I can also center content. So I'm going to start with center content. Okay, so now the image there is centered in my frame. If I went to fitting and I said fill frame proportionally, it would fill the frame, but I'm still losing parts on either side. If I right click and I say fitting, fit content proportionally, it will fit the whole image inside of my square. If I right click and go to fitting and say fit content to frame, it will stretch the content to fit the frame. So you see how I have different options for how I'm controlling it. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to go to fit, fill frame proportionally, like that. Then I will double click on the image and I'm going to move it over to control the composition a little bit better. So maybe like that. So now that I have this set up correctly, if I were to zoom in, I'll press Control-0 so we can see the whole image. Do you guys see how it's kind of blurry and jagged on the side here? And maybe in your case, you can see it more on your own computer. This is because InDesign only gives us a preview of what the final image looks like. And that's so that it doesn't take up, you know, let's say we had a 100-page book with color images in it. We don't want InDesign to run really slow because of all those high-resolution images, so it gives us a preview image. If I want to see it in its highest resolution, I can right click on the image and go to display performance. Right now it's on typical display. I can switch to high quality display and it will sharpen up and give me a little bit more detail. I can also go to display performance fast display and I get just a gray box with an X in it. So it shows us where the content is but not the detail. So I'm going to go back to display performance and I'm going to say typical display. There it is. Now, as I said before, in, the, in this world, we want to make sure that we do our photo processing separate from the actual end result. So let's say I wanted this image in black and white. I'm going to go back to my folder here. There's my image. Let me right click and open that with Photoshop. There's that image. Let me apply a black and white filter to this. So I'll go to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and let me do a Channel Mixer. 
Let me turn it to monochrome and quickly go through my settings here to see which one I like. I think I like the blue filter. Yeah, I like this bottom being nice and dark like that. I also might want to rotate this just a little bit so that this isn't so distorted. So I might go in and do a little bit of rotation. Let me create a layer from the background here. And let me go ahead and free transform. I'm going to rotate that just a little bit so that that's vertical along the side. We'll do a little cropping. Let's apply. Let's crop that down just a little bit. All right, we'll say like that. So I did post-processing on it. I'll confirm it. Now when I do File, Save As, I could save it as a new file and replace it. So let me go back to 109 here, Fall of 2017. I could say, you know what, this is going to be underscore black and white. And I could save. There's my black and white version. Oh, I, I saved a Photoshop file. It needs to be a JPEG file. So the other option, though, if I go to File, Save As, and go back to JPEG, you could do a save for web, too. I want it to be the same name here. And I'm doing this on purpose. Hold on one second to your question. I'm doing the same name. It's going to be JPEG. I'll click Save. Yes, I'll replace it. And now this image can be updated. So let me go into Links. Notice that the image link has a triangle next to it, meaning it's been changed. I can right click and say update link, and it's going to convert to the black and white version. So the reason that I was showing you this is because I wanted you to understand that uh, making an edit in Photoshop then repopulates because it's a linked file back in. So I need to adjust the fitting because I did adjust the crop a little bit. So let me go to fitting, and I'm going to fill frame proportionally and then adjust this over like that. And therefore, it's a linked file. What was your question? No, in, in InDesign, you can actually place a lot of different file types. You can probably even place a Photoshop file directly in it. I don't recommend it. I think it's better to have a JPEG to come in. A JPEG or a PNG is probably your best choice. PNG will preserve transparency. JPEG obviously uh, won't. So now that I have that in, remember I can still right click on it and go to display performance, high quality display, and have that sharpen up. So now it's a matter of adding some, some text. So maybe I need to actually use my type tool here. This works by drawing a text box. You're going to put your type in the text box. So if this was Garth Brooks, I would say something like Garth Brooks. I can adjust up here in, in this ribbon, obviously things like center the text, left justify. We're going to spend a whole lecture on typography and fonts and, and that sort of thing. So we'll do more relating to this. I can adjust the size. I can make it bigger. Maybe it needs to be a little bit smaller, something like that. OK, I want to draw a line underneath this, for example. I'll go to the Line tool, and I'll draw a line that goes from here to there. If I hold down Shift, it'll stay straight for me. Go to right there. And then maybe I'll put a little bit of type underneath it, maybe the album title. So we'll do another little box here. Notice that when I'm dragging, and it's kind of hard for you to see, there are little guides that appear so that I can snap to the end of my line and make it consistent. Let me go to the center here. And let's say, uh, you know, an album title. I don't know. I'm, I'm making, making stuff up. So I have those two. See how each of these text boxes, though, is surrounded by a blue line that represents my text box? Sometimes we want to be able to see what we're working on without those lines in the way. To do that, we can go to the View menu, and we can go to what's called Screen Mode and switch from Normal to Preview. 
and that gives us a view that doesn't have any boxes on it, no guides. And that, that can let us make a few adjustments. I can move that up a little bit tighter, maybe move that down a little bit tighter, and you can see as you start to create it. Now, in this particular context, maybe, uh, maybe this album, not that it would be, is an explicit album, so I should go find that little logo and add it. So if I do a, a search, I'll just do an image, a Google image search. Um, explicit lyrics. There we go. This is what I'm looking for. One of these little, little uh, things. Something like this. Let me go ahead and view the image. All right, that works. Let me save the image as. And I'm going to put it into my folder. Remember, everything goes in that folder so that the linked files are maintained. So we'll go back to live demonstrations here. And this was in 109. And I'll go ahead and save that. I'll go back to InDesign. And this time, I'm just going to go to File and Place. I haven't created the frame yet. I'll go to File and then Place, and I'll drop this straight in. And it's way too big. So I'm showing you this on purpose. So in this case, I need to make this a little bit smaller. I'm going to use this tool right here, which is like a series of little dots with an arrow. It's called the Free Transform tool. And then I'll make this smaller. I'm holding down Shift to keep it in proportion. If I use just my regular arrow and I start to make a differences, it will crop what I'm working with. So I don't want that. So I'm going to use this free transform to shrink this down. And we'll stick that parental advisory there on it as well. Now, maybe I want you know, a logo or something. Garth Brooks has a logo, so maybe I need to go get that. What we could do another images. Garth Brooks logo, you know, one of these sort of things. Maybe I wanted that. Um, I could find that somewhere. Let's see if I can find one that's a big enough size to work from here. Let me look. I'm going to look larger than. I can get something here. All right, that one's pretty. That one's pretty large. Let me go ahead and view the image. Save image as. There we go. Now I'll go ahead and go to File and then Place. Oops. Way too big. We need to make that smaller. Put it down here. Okay. Now, unfortunately, this has a black background. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go back into Photoshop and get rid of that background. So let me go back to Photoshop. I'll go to File and then Open. Let me open up that file. And in this context, um, I need to isolate the object. The easiest way to do it is probably the magic wand. We'll select this. I'll hold down Shift, select that. Select the two insides there. And I need to make a layer from the background first. So I'll right click and say Layer from Background. I'll press Delete. And now I just have this showing up. I'll go ahead and go to File and then uh, Save. And I want this to be a JPEG again. I'm going to replace the same name. Oh, sorry, I don't want it to be a JPEG. I want it to be a PNG. So I want to preserve the transparency. So let me switch to PNG. I'll click Save. Now in this case, it didn't update because it's a different file, because I needed the PNG. So over here, I have a couple different things that I could do. I could first just select the shape, go back to File, and then Place, and find this version and drop it in. Or I could go back to my Links menu here, find the link that is this file, and I could say I want to relink it. Make sure I get the correct one. I think it's this one is relink. Yep. And then I can go find 
Oops. The updated version and say open, and it'll relink that way. So I can do it through the links panel, or I can replace it over here. All right, so now that I have that, maybe I want this to be a little bit bigger. Now, so that's kind of hanging off the page or something. I don't know. I have to figure out what the composition needs to be. But you guys get the idea. OK? So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for this as the end product today. Obviously, whatever our artist and our album title you decide on, which is part of the fun of this. When you're done, first thing we need to do is save the InDesign file. So I'll go to File and then Save. And I'll go to my flash drive, or in this case, my OneDrive. And I'll call it Garth Album. And I'll go ahead and click Save. This is the InDesign document. So this is the file that contains all of the links. Now I'd like to point out that if you guys work on InDesign on your home computer and you have the new version, the Creative Cloud version, it is not backwards compatible to the school computers. I've asked and requested for the last year to update so that you guys can do this, but we're still on CS6. So if you do work or you open the file on your home computer and you have Creative Cloud, there is one way to get it back, but you have to do you make sure you do it at home, not here. It's you can go up to file and you can go, I think it's under export. No. Nope, it's under save, sorry. Go to file save as and right here under save as type InDesign CS4 or later IDML. You have to save it as that if you want to open it back on these computers. Okay? So just be aware that that's that's a problem. OK, so I have the InDesign file saved. Now it's a matter of saving the thing that I'm going to put on, on the website. So I'll go to File, and then Export. And for our purposes today, you're going to be exporting a JPEG. If we were doing something for print, and you were going to go print it, you would export to PDF, because it's a lot easier to print from PDF. So long term, it's mostly going to be PDF. When you do your... Um, your, your portfolio, when you do your lecture series poster, you're going to be creating a PDF because that's what you are going to be printing from. But for right now, we're going to do a JPEG. So under Save As Type, I'm going to choose JPEG. You could choose PNG. doesn't really matter. I'll go ahead and click on Save. I get the Export JPEG options. So right here, this would be if I had multiple pages. Which page do I want? I only have one page. No big deal. Do I want pages or spreads? This should actually be set to pages. It doesn't really matter because I only have one anyway. When we get down to image quality, maximum resolution here should be at 300. Okay, If it's not, it's, it might be 72 by default on yours. So make sure it's 300. Um, CMYK color space, the rest of these options are fine. We'll go ahead and click on export. And what InDesign does is it goes and gets the high quality versions of your file, combines them all together, and then hands you a JPEG out the other end. So if I were to go into my folder today, and there's the Garth Album JPEG. If I open that, you can see that it's the high quality version. Everything's nice and sharp, etc. Looks like there's a little bit of a halo around this st sticker. So I probably need to make a little adjustment to it and re-export it. I can do that by zooming in on my object. And I'm just going to use the regular black arrow and make this just a little bit smaller to clip off that little border, right like that. And then I'll export it again. I'll go to File, Export, Save, Replace it, yes. All the same options here, Export. And now if I were to go open that one again, there you go. It's, it's fixed. Those little borders were gone. So you always want to have a look at the final version and make sure it is, in fact, what you want it to be. OK? Are there any questions about general InDesign? 
I know I talked for a long time today, but like I said, you're just bringing in a few images. It shouldn't take you too long to get through the album cover. Please have fun with this. I, I spend time trying to come up with things that are fun for you to learn. So hopefully this is a fun one. Um, take some time, figure out what band you want or what artist you want, and then assemble something from there. What about the draw along, the text along the line? Don't worry about that right now. Because Don't worry about that right now. If you really want to do it, I'll show you. Um, but it's a little bit more advanced. Essentially, if, if you wanted to do that, you need a line. And so I could create one with uh, the pen tool here, like that. I could also create one that was curving instead, but this is a little bit more involved with the pen tool because you have to know how to work the pen tool to create the line in the first place, which we will cover. When I go to type on a path there, it's as simple as clicking on the path where I want to start typing, and then I can't type. Whatever, okay. But it types along that that path. Um, the other thing that's possible is maybe you want your font color to be different. If you do, if I select the font, and I can come down here, see there's a little T there that's black on the left side. It's right there. If I double click it, I can pick a different color in here and have it as that color. Okay. So if you have specific questions, let me know. Um, also, I apologize. I try really hard to have your grades from last, the last assignment back to you the same day that you turn in your next assignment. I still have about 10 more of you to grade, so I haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, I promise next uh, Monday that you'll get your grade sheets. Okay.